Uh, hello. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well and having a nice day. Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much for the great introduction. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for being here early in the morning. Um, it's actually quite lovely to talk first thing in the morning and see what everybody's thinking when their minds are fresh. Um, so this paper sort of stems from the book that I've, I've just kind of finished that's coming out in January on MLK Day on the emotions. And what I'm trying to do in my broader work is to think about King not just as a strategist, but also a kind of theorist of the emotions. Most people think about King as a kind of tactician or like a moral theorist. And a lot of my work is like trying to find that synergy between these two components in King. And I think you're gonna see that today. Um, and a lot of my work is thinking about his views about the emotions theoretically, but then how he uses that theory, that philosophical theory of the emotions to then think about the right type of tactics that will actually foster political action. Uh, so I look forward to talking to you and uh, to hearing your thoughts especially. Okay, so today 67% of uh, black Americans say they're dissatisfied with the way that democracy is working in the United States. We also know that Biden's approval rates are particularly abysmal, and this is true especially among racialized people in the United States. So we can look at recent data, um, but one that I pulled up is um, from 2020, a CNN poll, which says that among people of color, 45% now approve of Biden's overall performance, down from 54% in the spring, and that decline includes a six-point dip among black adults. So some of you may know Van Jones, he's a commentator, uh, a black American commentator at CNN, and he tries to kind of, he kind of talked a little bit about these numbers and what might stand behind them. So Jones says there's a special heartbreak because first of all, the pain is more intense. Rising grass prices, food prices have really walloped the black community in a particular way, but the hopes were so much higher, he says. But black disappointment goes deeper than concerns about rising costs. African Americans came out for Biden in big numbers in 2018 and 2020, and yet in 2022, there's a widespread feeling that the Democrats have overpromised and underdelivered for black voters. And so he says, you're going through a summer of real heartbreak, and the polls show that Biden has got to take this seriously. So we see that some of the concerns behind black disappointment are economic, they're about inflation, but they're also about Biden and his response to inequality in the US. So according to a recent Pew study, 65% of black Americans say the increased national attention on racial inequality has not led to changes that improve their lives. 44% say that equality for black people in the US is not likely to be achieved. So why is that happening? What's happening? I mean, as many of you will recall, thinking about the summer um, of protests in response to the brutal murder of George Floyd, people were really hoping these protests were going to lead to some change. And then we see in 2022, after the big summer of protests, that people then lose sort of or become very disappointed in Biden and his response to all that protest that was happening. So that is, I think, part of the explanation of why people, um, why racialized people in particular, black Americans in particular, um, are kind of uh, less in support of Biden, you know, as time has been going. Now, this sense of disappointment among black Americans is not new. Um, there's a really long-standing tradition of disappointment, especially among black American political thinkers. Sarah Marcus, who's a political theorist at Notre Dame, has written actually a really wonderful book on disappointment. And she argues that disappointment was sort of the defining sentiment among Americans, especially black Americans, uh, post-Reconstruction. And she says that this disappointment really becomes the basis of so many things that happen, po the formation of new political collectivities, the form of literary, uh, the, the basis of literary movements and art, artistic achievements. And she really sees Du Bois's book, uh, The Soul of Black Folks, as kind of the central articulation of the black experience of disappointment after Reconstruction. So for Marcus, Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks captures this moment of disappointment that's very central to the black experience at this time. So Du Bois rather famously wrote, the nation has not yet found peace from its sins. The freedman has not yet found in freedom his promised land. Whatever good may have come in these years of change, the shadow of a deep disappointment rests upon the Negro people. A disappointment all the more bitter because of the unattained ideal was unbounded, save by the simple ignorance of a lowly people. So King Du Bois rather expresses a deep and profound sense of disappointment 
And part of that disappointment results from the great promise that Reconstruction held, but ultimately failed to live up to. So as Marcus explains in her book, disappointment lies in the shared experience of windows of opportunity for transformation, but that close without delivery. Now, disappointment is also more than that. So in some sense, there's a past-looking aspect to disappointment where you feel like this thing hasn't come about. But then it also sort of projects into the future because as Du Bois writes about disappointment, it embodies freedom too long, the long sought we still seek. So Marcus says that disappointment is a desire for change. It's an open-ended yearning, a longing um, for structural transformation. And this continues on even after those opportunities, those windows for transformation have actually closed. So in this sense, we can see dis disappointment as having like a, a kind of future component, it sort of projects into the future. It doesn't just look back at the past. Now, this tradition of, uh, of black disappointment does not just end with Du Bois, of course. We actually see it come up again in the civil rights movement. So Marcus devotes a chapter of her book to the soundscapes of the 1960s, and she considers them as being records of the disappointments um, that followed the passage of civil rights legislation in the mid 20th century. And she focuses on the March Against Fear that took place in Jackson, Mississippi, um, and that was led by James Meredith, and then uh, ultimately led by King and Stokely Carmichael. And she looks at the, what she calls her the contesting chants. So we had Freedom Now versus Black Power, and there were debates about the right songs for the march to sing. We Shall Overcome versus We Shall Overrun. And Marcus looks at these conflicting soundscapes um, as a place for expressing disagreements about the right tactics for expressing, or sorry, rather overcoming disappointment. Now, I think Marcus's book is quite brilliant and certainly worth a read. I think she does a really nice job sort of drawing out the meaning of disappointment um, by looking at very detailed case studies. But one thing that never really becomes clear in her book is the question of why. Why do all these thinkers, Carmichael, King, Du Bois, take the time to express and articulate their disappointment? What are they trying to achieve? And I think that in focusing solely on the soundscapes during the March Against Fear, I think Marcus misses an opportunity to discuss some of the theoretical underpinnings of some of the sonic practices that took place. And in turn, because she doesn't look at those theoretical underpinnings, I think she actually misses uh, kind of the sentiments or the view or the justifications behind King's own views about his preferences for singing We Shall Overcome in contrast to some of the other um, slogans that were at, at play. So the underlying suggestion of this paper really is that King's writings are really, I believe, part of the great American tradition, the black American tradition of democratic disappointment. And I think some of his most important writings, A Letter from Birmingham Jail and I Have a Dream, along with some of his most important sermons, uh, such as Shattered Dreams and Unfulfilled Dreams, are expressions of King's deep desire for the realization of democratic ideals and the expectations that this desire not only could, but should be fulfilled. And then the disappointment that results from the dissatisfaction of these desires and expectations. So I'm gonna to try to fill in some of the gaps left by Marcus's work by elucidating King's theory of legitimate black democratic disappointment. And from here on in, I'm just gonna to refer to it as disappointment because that's a bit of a mouthful. So I'm gonna argue that he offers a novel account of the nature, function, and value of disappointment. And I think one of the things I wanna say just as a bit of background is I think there's a lot of political theory and even the popular view of King that will always associate King with hope optimism, you know, joy, all of these really positive emotions. And one of the parts of my project is to draw out some of the darker emotions that are present in King's views um, and present in even his rhetoric and his philosophy. Um, so I'm gonna argue that he offers this novel account. Disappointment for King is understood as a cognitive attitude with an affective component. What do I mean by that? On the one hand, it has this beliefy part. So it's the belief that one's legitimate expectations have not been met, and the feeling of being let down, saddened, and frustrated that results from having that belief. So on the one hand, I'm gonna argue that disappointment is intrinsically valuable, meaning it's valuable in and of itself because it's an appropriate emotional response to unmet legitimate expectations. On the other hand, I'm gonna argue that King thinks it's instrumentally valuable as a necessary precondition for political action. So 
I'm going to argue then that King articulates his disappointment precisely because he seeks to do something with it. Namely, he hopes to encourage a sense of disappointment in his audience and ultimately to channel that disappointment into determined and constructive political action through song. So just to give you a bit of like a heads up for the structure of this talk, in section one, I'm gonna talk about King's dream, which is an articulation of a set of democratic ideals to which he was aspiring towards. In section two, I'm gonna consider how King's democratic dream remained unfulfilled and led to a distinctly political form of black disappointment. In section three, I'm going to explore King's negative arguments about what we should not do in response to disappointment. In section four, I'm gonna consider his positive arguments where he tells us more about what we should do with that sense of disappointment and how we ought to respond to it. In section five, I'm gonna close by looking at some of King's claims um, that black spirituals and freedom songs are appropriate expressions of democratic disappointment. In his view, they not only express a disappointment of unfulfilled democratic dreams, but they encourage continued determined action to realize these dreams. So most of you are familiar with, I have a very famous, I have a dream speech uh, that he gave, that King gave in 1963. But even before that, King had long been talking about the American dream. In an early sermon called The Negro and the American Dream, he wrote, in a real sense, America is essentially a dream, a dream yet unfulfilled. It's a dream of a land where men of all races, colors and creeds will live together as brothers. The substance of the dream is expressed in these sublime words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the dream. It's a profound, eloquent, and unequivocal expression of the dignity and worth of all human personality. So King believed that American society was formed on a shared aspiration or commitment to ensuring the freedom, equality, and dignity of all of its citizens. And this commitment stemmed, he believed, from their shared belief in the inherent worth of all Americans. Now King saw the best and the highest articulation of these democratic values in the Emancipation Proclamation. So he tells us in I Have a Dream, he reminds us of this. He says, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of light of, light of hope to millions of uh, Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. So as all of you know, the proclamation was decreed by Abraham Lincoln on January 1st of 1863, and it declared to all enslaved people in Confederate states, which were at war obviously with the Union at the time, that they were forever free, and it made them eligible for paid military service in the Union Army. Now, King saw this proclamation as an attempt to realize the American dream for all Americans, black and white. And he believed that together, the proclamation, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence were what he called promissory notes. So they were promissory notes to which every American was to fall heir. A promise that all men, he says, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of liberty, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So in commemoration of the centennial of the original proclamation, King actually asks JFK for a second emancipation proclamation to free all black folks from second class citizenship. And he thought that that was really what was required now, um, that there needed to be a kind of follow up, a second instantiation of the emancipation proclamation. And actually uh, in the early 60s, King sends Kennedy a 75 page appeal to request uh, that this that this um, national rededication to these principles of the Emancipation Proclamation happens, and he asks for an executive order prohibiting racial segregation. So he thinks this is you know, a way of sort of living up to the aspirations that were enmeshed and embedded in the proclamation. Now, why did King think this was so important? Well, in his earlier work, and I'm happy to talk about this in more detail during the Q&A, but he argued that racial segregation was a moral stain on the United States. In his view, it debased the dignity of black people. So King believed that a full recognition of the inherent worth and dignity of all men requires that all men must be treated as ends and never as mere means. And he believed that racial segregation violated that moral imperative because he argued it treated black men and women as mere means rather than as ends in themselves and thereby reduced black Americans to objects or things rather than persons. 
And so he argued that racial segregation undermined the inherent dignity and worth of black Americans. Um, and following another philosopher named Buber, he says that it, it call, he, call, he substitutes what he called an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship, um, relegating persons to the status of things, not as people of equal value to be respected. Now, how exactly does racial segregation relegate um, the segregated to the status of mere objects or things? King has a lot of different arguments about this, but one of them is that he thinks that inherently what happens with racial segregation is that it elevates white people to a position of superiority while relegating back black people to a position of inferiority. And it gives white people a false sense of their, their superiority, which allows them to objectify black Americans. So he thinks that that is inherent uh, in contrast to the, the, the deep worth and respect uh, that black people are sort of are, are owed. And so he thinks, I think what's also interesting in this uh, like long memorandum that he writes to Kennedy, he says, look, this is a really urgent wrong that we have to remedy because if we don't, the legacy is going to accumulate. And in some sense for him, the moral wrongness is only gonna get more, it's gonna get worse and worse and deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think that's precisely because he's looking at economic inequality and looking at the conditions of black Americans in the South. And he's concerned that this, this, this legacy is only continuing and actually building momentum. So he sees it as an urgent moral wrong that requires moral attention immediately. Now, King is sort of, thinking that, look, there are already some steps that have been taken towards ensuring the democratic dream for black Americans. He looks specifically at Brown v. Ed um, as a new era of what he calls constructive integration. So according to him, he says this is a period where people really, so after Board v. Ed happens, he thinks again it's another call to live up to those aspirations of the Emancipation Proclamation. He thinks it's actually the courts trying to do that. And so he says, look, the moral challenge now is to work passionately for the complete realization of the ideals and principles that were first expressed in that proclamation and then reasserted just as fervently in the court's decision uh, in Brown v. Ed. So what is really required to um, ensure the American dream for black Americans? Well, King thinks two things are required. One of them is desegregation and the other is true integration. Now, what's the difference between these two things? Well, for King, desegregation is something that he sees as being eliminative, negative. What it does is it removes legal barriers to equal access to public places like schools, parks, restaurants, libraries, et cetera. And the hope is that this is going to, by removing these barriers, it opens up opportunities for black Americans and it bling, brings black and white people together physically in the same space because those legal barriers have been removed, right? But he points out that a desegregated society is not the same as an integrated one. So he says, desegregation leads to physical proximity without spiritual affinity. It gives us a society where men are physically desegregated and spiritually segregated, where elbows are together and hearts are apart. It leaves us with a stagnant equality of sameness rather than a constructive equality of oneness. So he worried that a society could be fully desegregated in a legal material sense without accompanying individual moral change. So this is why we need desegregation because segregation is a barrier, right? But it isn't gonna get us all the way to the ideal that King hopes for, for that democratic dream. So for that, you need a second component, right? So desegregation will remove those physical barriers that allow people from all different races to be in the same space together. But that doesn't mean their hearts are together, right? And so this is why he thinks that ultimately there also has to be what he calls true integration. But the thing that, that King says over and over and over again is that this kind of integration is not something that can be legislated because what it requires is a change of heart. That is not something the law can do. You can put two people in a room together, but for uh, you know, people who have the ideology of white supremacy to change, like that's something that they have to do on their own. So for King, that, real, that true integration really is actually the work of white people. They have to find a way to get over their white supremacist beliefs. So I think from King, I think what's interesting is that I think sometimes he's labeled as an optimist and I don't think that we see a true optimism here in some sense because he's not like the optimist who just believes that racial progress is going to inevitably happen. Um, but he's also not like the pessimist that believes that racial progress is impossible. He is what he calls himself a realist. 
Uh, he believed that real progress was possible, and this is a, a lesson that he tells us again and again and again that he took from his enslaved ancestors, because he believed they found freedom through their concerted action. So for him, he looks at abolition as a kind of evidence that great strides have been made and that they could again be made. But he also wants to recognize there's still a long way to go, and action is certainly required again in his view. So ultimately, we see that this beginning period that starts with Board v. Ed in the 50s of constructive integration doesn't really live up to its promise. By the time we get to the, like the early, mid, late 60s, King is looking around and he's saying that black Americans are not living as free and equal citizens. So despite the prosperity that's existing in the US at this time, he is actually at great pains and he really puts out the empirical data that black Americans, especially in the South, are, you know, are still facing poverty, they're experiencing color-based discrimination, and they're deprived of opportunities for education, uh, you know, social and economic opportunities. So for him, in the 60s, the American dream is still in tatters. Now, King tells us that one of the most agonizing problems of human experience is that of unfulfilled dreams, or what he sometimes calls disappointed hopes. So in explanation of this phenomenon, King turns back to the life of the Apostle Paul. So Paul, as many of you will know, had the desire to visit Spain, to spread the Christian gospel there, and to meet and commune with the Christians of Rome on his way. And when Paul thinks about this aspiration, he feels a great sense of joy, um, and he spends a lot of his attention, like preparing and planning for this trip. Now, as King describes it, it's a noble dream that grips Paul's life and saturates his being. But sadly, as we know, Paul never went to Rome in the way he wished. He went there as a prisoner, he spent his time in prison, in a prison cell, and he was held captive for his faith. As King sees it, Paul had the desire to go to Spain. He had the intention to do it, and he even tried to do it. He packed his bags and set out on his way. But his dream of going to Spain in the way he had hoped wasn't fulfilled. So King sees Paul's tragic story as one of shattered dreams and blasted hopes. Now, dreams, as King understands them, it's important to kind of, kind of unpack. They're not just desires. And I think this is something that Marcus really misses in her work. It's not just like he wants something, right? There's something loftier than a mere desire, right? It's not like just wanting ice cream today, right? It's something bigger. It's something loftier. It's something to aspire to, something that you believe is worthy of pursuit. And so the way that I would describe this is to say they are desires with moral content. They're expressive of our most deeply held values. So in this way, dreams give shape and meaning to our lives because they are something that we're actively working towards. They take attention, they take planning, they take organization. They also require not just intellectual attention, but embodied attention. So Paul didn't just plan his route to Spain. He actually bought the supplies, packed his bags, and then started you know, going and went. So he not only intended to go to Spain, he tried and started to do so, and is because these dreams are so central and orienting that is utterly devastating when despite our best effort, our dreams go unfulfilled. Now, of course, this problem of unfulfilled dreams, sadly, is not just one that Paul faces, it's one that all of us as humans face in our life. As King tells us, human life is replete with these experiences. King talks about many great men, you know, in his, his sermons on disappointed dreams. He talks about Gandhi, he talks about Woodrow Wilson, um, and he talks about Jesus. And he says that all of these great people have faced disappointed dreams, but not just them, us too. And so, King's sermons on dreams make two, a few significant points. One, disappointment is a common part of human life. Two, satisfaction of our deepest desires is never assured. And coming to terms with that fact is psychologically grueling. So this is the tragic element of King's realism, right? So he believes that moral progress is possible, but it's never assured. It's always elusive. And that is sort of the tragedy, right? Progress is possible, but it's, it, just because it's possible doesn't mean that it's going to come for certain. And that is something that King really works through. He continues to talk about disappointed dreams through his entire life, right up to the end. So we have to try, and this is part of, I think, 
Um, as Paul Taylor elaborates, ethical life is both a struggle and an experiment. So we have to try through different paths to satisfy our desires and, and our dreams, and we do so knowing all the while that failure may be imminent. It could happen at any moment. So no matter how much we desire something, no matter how important it is to our lives, it isn't assured. And so for Taylor, this is really part of the trials of tragic earthly striving. So it's partly because we're humans, right, that this, this striving and this struggle exists. So King tells us that um, this tragic element of life, the disappointment of unfulfilled dreams, is perhaps felt most in moments where we feel like our dream is just about to be realized, and then it isn't. So in 1963, and I'm sure you talked a bit about this yesterday, uh, King was called by the Southern Christian leadership to Birmingham, Alabama to desegregate its businesses. And as King tells it, after he and his supporters threatened an economic boycott on Easter Sunday, Birmingham merchants promised to take steps towards desegregation, such as permanently removing racist signs that said whites only. Now King took them at their word and believed that this was a concrete step towards realizing the dream of, segregation, of desegregation in Birmingham. And so accordingly, King, along with his uh, other tacticians and supporters like Shuttlesworth um, and other leaders of the Alabama Christian movement for human rights, they agreed to call a moratorium on, the, uh, on, on any type of demonstration. But unfortunately, as King writes, as the weeks and months unfolded, we realized, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remained. As in so many experiences of the past, King explains, and now repeating Du Bois' famous words, we were confronted with blasted hopes and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So again, going back to Du Bois, that moment after Reconstruction held so much promise. But ultimately, as Jim Crow is established, we see that that moment doesn't live up to the promise it held. In this moment, the merchants make a promise to take steps towards desegregating Birmingham. But that promise is not realized, it's not lived up to. So again, King is hearkening back to the hope, uh, the promise of the moment, which is then ultimately not lived up to and realized. So when the merchants of Birmingham fail to keep that promise, King is deeply disappointed. And it's, I think in the letter from Birmingham jail, for example, he uses the word disappointment 12 times. If you read one of the later chapters in Where We Go From Here, uh, From Community to Chaos, there's a whole chapter that is a litany of disappointments. So disappointment is a common theme for King. So he feels saddened and let down, and he has, he tells us that these feelings result from having his hopes dashed. And, and we see that in Birmingham, the failure of the merchant's sting precisely because it came after making that promise in which King desired and believed in. Now, in his discussion of black disappointment, the philosopher Bill Lawson argues that disappointment is a result of wanting and expecting something to happen and then it not happening. So it's key that unlike in the case of mere dissatisfaction, disappointment presupposes some expectations. So for example, if somebody fails to win a lottery she wanted to win but didn't expect to win, then she can't, Lawson thinks, properly be said to be disappointed. She's merely dissatisfied. And so I would argue, in contrast, when the merchants promised to remove those signs, King didn't just want them to do um, what they promised, but he also expected them to do so. So King was disappointed because his expectations, along with his wants, were not satisfied. Now, Lawson mistakenly claims that King doesn't advocate for or express disappointment. In his view, he argues that King was among the black Americans who no longer had any expectations of positive behavior of white Americans towards black Americans. So as Lawson describes these folks, black, these are black Americans, he says, who are no longer disappointed when they hear of or experience anti-black racism. They're still dissatisfied, of course, because they yearn for better conditions for black Americans. They still believe in the American dream, as King might say. But in Lawson's view, they're not disappointed when it's not realized. They're merely dissatisfied because they didn't expect anything different. So here, Lawson seems to think about expectation in a probabilistic sense, right? So, the idea is that like expectation is a belief that something is likely to happen. Now in Lawson's reading, King doesn't have this kind of expectation of the merchants because he didn't think it was likely that the merchants would live up to their promise. This is why in Lawson's reading of King, King cannot be said to be disappointed when the merchants fail to keep their promise. I don't think this gets King right because I think there are other ways of thinking about expectations. 
King was not naive. I don't think he really thought it was very likely that the merchants were going to live up to his promise. He'd been dealing with these folks for a long time. He had been disappointed again and again and again and again. But despite this, King's expectations, I think he still has a sense of expectations in a couple of different ways. So expectations can come in the probabilistic way that Lawson has talked about, but they can also come in two other ways, predictive and prescriptive. Now first, even if it wasn't likely, King believed that it was at least possible that the merchants would keep their promise. This is what is sometimes referred to as a predictive expectation. Why does King have this belief? As all of you know, he believed that because of God's goodness, there was always the possibility that we can be better than we are. And that's true even if in past circumstances, the merchants may have failed to live up to their promise. They could now or in the future always do something different. They could always be better. And that is really, I think, the theological belief that underlies King's commitment to realism, that po progress is at least possible. It's not guaranteed, it's not likely, but it's at least possible. Second, King believes that the merchants should do what they promised, even if they don't. They should have, right? This is what is sometimes referred to as a prescriptive expectation. Prescriptive expectations are expectations of someone. It's a belief that the other person should do what they ought to do. So recall, King starts a letter from Birmingham jail explaining that he's in Birmingham because he's there to live up to a promise that he made. Several months ago, he says, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. So I am here, he says, along with several members of my staff because we were invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here, and he is here because he lived up to a promise. Now, King, I think, in this part of the letter is trying to establish his moral authority to be in Birmingham by showing that he is an honorable person. He is someone who does what he should do by living up, right? That idea of living up language sort of like suggests aiming for something lofty, a morally valuable standard or ideal. So he is living up to his promises, even when doing so is difficult, he tells us. And King believes that following his leads, the, mer the merchants should live up to their promises, even if doing so is difficult. So ultimately, I think King does have expectations of the white merchants. No, he doesn't think it's likely they're going to keep their promises. Again, King is not a fool, right? But he's hoping that they will see that they actually have a moral duty. I'm going to say more about that, but that they should live up to their promises, right? And that they can. So those are the kind of expectations that still exist. And this is why when those expectations aren't met, King is deeply disappointed. Because he believes the merchants didn't keep their promise to desegregate Birmingham, even though they could and should have. And so he's deeply disappointed in them because both forms of those expectations are unmet. So as he says, his hopes were blasted. His aspirations for desegregation in Birmingham were, despite his initial promise, unfulfilled. So his dream for Birmingham is shattered. So as King tells it, the story of Birmingham is an example of the broader phenomenon of disappointment in the U.S., like Du Bois, King believed in the democratic value and potential of the Emancipation Proclamation, as well as the civil rights legislation that came after it. King saw these documents, as I mentioned, as a promissory note, right, that all Americans were expected to and obliged to keep up as part of their commitment to assuring, ensuring a just and democratic America. And in his assessment, the white, the white merchants, just like the rest of white America, had failed to live up to their liberatory promise. As King wrote, instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, he says, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. So the disappointment that King speaks of here is distinctly democratic. In failing to uphold the commitments embedded in the proclamation and more recent civil rights legislation, such as Board Vied, King believed the white Americans had failed to satisfy their civic duty. So just as the merchants failed to live up to their promise, white Americans were failing to live up to their promise. And in doing so, they failed to live up to their duty as democratic citizens, united under the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Emancipation Proclamation. So King thought that his disappointment was appropriate because he was entitled to expect and even demand of his white fellow citizens that they take action to end racial segregation. And so this is why, as Jonathan Ryder has suggested, King's disappointment is always inflected with a sense of righteous indignation, which is an emotion that is driven by the belief that justice has not been served. As King writes, disappointed dreams rightly leave us frustrated, wondering if life has any justice. <laughs>
Okay, so he's tried to give us a case in a way for explaining his disappointment, right? Why, why he has disappointment, why it's appropriate response. But he asks then, and this is a central question for King, it's one that he comes back to you at many different moments in his life. What do you do when you find your dreams unrealized, your hopes unfulfilled, and you see no basic solution in your environment to the problem you're facing? In other words, how do you deal with disappointment? How should you deal with it? So King considers four options. Denial, bitterness, detachment, and fatalism. And as we're gonna see, he rejects all of them. So if you've ever faced disappointment, you know that one strategy is to just squash it down. Put it out of your mind, forget about it. Now for King, that is definitely not the right solution. Why? Because he thinks that actually it's right for people to have desires and to have dreams. So they may not be fulfilled, but it's appropriate to have those dreams and those desires. And as I'm gonna say a bit more about later, he also thinks that maintaining those desires and the recognition that those desires have been unfulfilled is actually politically useful. So you definitely shouldn't go into a state of denial. Don't squash the disappointment down. King says that another option is to distill our frustrations into bitterness and resentment. He says some people become bitter and cynical, uh, developing a callous attitude and cold heart as a way of dealing with their disappointment. Now, why is that so problematic? Two reasons. One, he thinks that sometimes what happens when we're bitter is that we direct it towards ourselves. And that leads towards self-pity, um, which he thinks can scar the human personality and actually harm the person herself. How so? He doesn't exactly say. But what I can tell you from some of his other writings is that King thinks that oppressed people, especially racialized oppressed people, have a duty of self-love. Um, and self-respect. And anything that will lead us to not have self-respect or self-love um, will ultimately not be the right thing for King. So he thinks somehow that bitterness is in contrast to this duty to self-love because it ultimately leads towards negative feelings towards oneself. Now, another option then is that when we're dealing with these pent-up frustrations and disappointments, we could do so by taking our anger out on other people. So he says that sometimes people become mean and then meanness becomes their dominating trait. They love and trust no one, and he says they don't expect love and trust love from anybody. So they might be mean to their spouses, their children, and people around them. So in other words, because we're sort of angry at the universe, King says, we take it out on other people. He also says that collectively, disappointment might tend to find its release in aggression. So he talks specifically about the riots in Chicago and Watts as examples of pent up frustrations and disappointment and despair that ultimately expresses itself through violent action. Now here's what's interesting. Most people are gonna think that King is gonna say, do you know why riots are bad? Because they hurt white people. That's not what King says, actually. What he says is this kind of aggression ultimately becomes a way of inflicting harm on the black self. Because he's always very like aware of the fact that there will be a, a clapback for anybody, any black person that engages in riotous actions. So ultimately his worry is that even though there may be this tendency sometimes to have disappointment and reflected on other people, it almost gets mirrored back onto black folks. And that's his greatest worry, that it will actually lead to black death. So he rejects that bitterness option because, you know, on, on two fronts. But the main argument here is that it just isn't good for the black soul, the black personality, and the black body. Okay, so what are our other options? We can't be, uh, we can't squash it down. We can't be in denial. We can't be bitter. We can't be filled with bitterness. What else could we do? Well, he says we could become a bit detached. So he says some people will deal with disappointment by completely withdrawing into themselves, building walls around themselves, and they lose zest for living and become indifferent to the people and world around them. So they don't experience joy. They don't experience sorrow. They're too detached. He says they're neither selfish nor selfless. And to have such experience, he thinks at, this, at the bottom that this is an attempt to escape life and its disappointments. So he worries that disappointment of this nature will sometimes lead to a kind of fatalism where people will start to think that they don't have any freedom and that all the events are determined by necessity. And he says that this tendency leads to absolute resignation. They do not seek, he says, to change their circumstances. They wait instead for external foreordained forces to deliberate and decide for them. And he said this is psychologically and intellectually repressive and leaves people feeling helpless. Now, of course, King recognizes there is no true freedom. 
we're always making, freedom always operates within, within a framework of constraints, divine and otherwise. But in his view, people are both free and constrained. So for him, freedom is the act of deliberating and deciding and responding within the limits of our human nature. So ultimately, he thinks that we can make a choice about what to do with our disappointment. Of course, there's certain constraints, but he thinks that that is where freedom lies, where we get to decide what we do with ourselves. And so ultimately, he says that even if destiny prevents our going to some attractive Spain, there still remains in us the capacity to take this disappointment, to answer it, to make our individual response to it, to stand up to it and do something with it. And failing to recognize this, the fatalist leaves humans without the tools they need to constructively navigate their lives, he says. And then adding to that tragic element of life that we're already experiencing, right? So King has long dreamed of freedom, but he continued to face racial segregation and racial prejudice. How should he respond? With bitterness? No. That would corrode the human personality. Should he conclude that segregation is the will of God and resign himself? No. King says that he should not engage in escapism or acquiescence. Instead, he writes that he must honestly face and accept his disappointment. He must face the fact that his dreams are unfulfilled, and he must ask himself, how do I turn that liability to an asset? How can, I, how can I, confined in some narrow Roman cell, unable to reach life's pain, transform the cell from a dungeon of shame into a haven of redemptive suffering? So King sees in disappointment um, an opportunity to transfigure both our cells, but also broader American society. And like Gandhi, he believed that individual and political transformation began with certain negative emotions. So Gandhi explicitly tells us that discontent is a very useful thing. As long as man is contented with his present lot, Gandhi says, so long is it difficult to persuade him to come out of it. Therefore, it is that every reform must be preceded by discontent. We throw away things we have only when we cease to like them. So in Gandhi's view, discontent is a necessary precondition for political action. Because we have to move from a state of accepting things as they are to what he sees as a state of non-acceptance. Discontent is a necessary part of this process in Gandhi's view because it's not liking things as they are and wanting something different, different and no longer feeling resigned to the situation as it is. And so Gandhi believes that only when they become discontent with British rule will, would Indians become motivated to remove the British from India. And what's interesting is that Gandhi believes that this discontent that he's seeing spread across India at the time, um, you know, where the movement is really beginning, he says it's spread because through India because people read the works of great Indian and English authors of the time who were critical of British colonialism in India. So when he introduces his very famous treatise, Hind Swaraj, which was first published in, as articles in a, in a local Gujarati newspaper, Gandhi says that one of his main purposes in writing his own text, he says, is to arouse among the people certain desirable sentiments. He believes discontent is, desi is a desirable sentiment and can be aroused in other people through his writings and reading those writings. Now, I think that King works with a similar ambition. He is looking to cultivate a state of non-acceptance or what he calls constructive non-conformity in his black audience in particular. So he believed that Christians have a mandate to be nonconformist. And he takes inspiration from that duty from thinking about Jesus as a transformed nonconformist. And so for him, there's a moral imperative to live differently and to, to follow a higher moral code than the status quo. So King links that nonconformity with what he calls a courage to ho hold a minority idea, an idea that's not very popular. Um, and he says that the Christians owe his ultimate allegiance to God. And if any earthly institution conflicts with God's will, it is the duty of Christians to revolt against it. To be nonconformist, we must not complacently adjust to the way things are. We must, according to King, transform our minds and then fight through nonviolent resistance for a better and more just world. So for him, disappointment and fostering those feelings of disappointment among his audiences is a way of remaining a nonconformist. Because at its heart, what is disappointment? Well, disappointment stems from an unsatisfied desire for things to be different, different than they are, and a belief that things could and should be different. So like discontent, disappointment expresses desires and expectations that are not only currently unfulfilled, but remain so. 
And so King's desire and hope for racial integration continues despite being thwarted and unfulfilled throughout his life. And he believes that his audience should actually have that same set of desires and expectations. And that is why he speaks again and again and again and again about his unfulfilled dream of racial justice. He wants his listeners to long and yearn, and not just that, but expect racial justice just as he does. So he doesn't want, he wants his dream to live on with and through his audience even after he is gone. And you know, it's one of his very last sermons is about disappointment. Again, he communicates this sentiment about shattered dreams. And he hopes that this dream will move uh, Americans to take immediate action to end racial segregation. Now, I think one of the biggest worries for King, and this is something that King really, I think, battled with in a lot of different ways, is despair. So dreams are unfulfilled again and again and again and again. At some point, when does that disappointment turn into despair? And how do we avoid despair? Because in some of other uh, writings by King, he really sort of sees despair as kind of a barrier to action. When we become despairing, we don't want to do anything because we don't believe anything can be different, right? So we've got to fight that sense of disappointment that's very key for King. So remember, we've got to keep our disappointment, we have to face it directly, but we also want to avoid despair because that becomes paralyzing. So how do we do this? Now, King believed that black spirituals, especially, we know this because he talks a lot about we shall overcome, was a crucial practice. It's a way to enact determination while we also face our disappointment. So in explanation, King tells us of his African ancestors, the enslaved who experienced the most tragic, as he says, the most tragic shattering of dreams. They were ripped from their roots, their language, and their families. They were beaten, exploited. And yet, he says, they found a way to continue fighting for their dreams. King tells us they would sing, I'm so glad that troubles don't last always, and I know my robe's going to fit me well because I tried it on at the gates of hell. By and by and by, I'm going to lay down my heavy load. King believed that it was because of their creative dynamic will that his ancestors developed a novel practice would not only, that would not only sustain themselves, he sees it as a gift actually, um, because it's a gift that's given to future generations as well who can sustain um, this sense of determination while also facing their disappointments. And what's interesting is that we really see King here building on Du Bois's writings on sorrow songs and the souls of black folks because he says something similar, that song becomes a way of channeling disappointment and despair into determined action because it can also lead to a sense of joy um, and community, etc. So over time, black spirituals, as we know, became the basis of the freedom songs of the movement against racial segregation. And King writes, freedom songs are the soul of the movement. They're more than just incantations of clever phrases designed to invigorate a campaign. They're as old as the history of, of the Negro in America. They are adaptations of songs the slaves so the slave sang, the sorrow songs, the shouts for joy, the battle hymns, and the anthems of our movement. I've heard people talk of their beat and rhythm, but we in the movement are as inspired by their words. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom is a sentence that needs no music to make its point. But we sing the freedom songs today for the same reasons the slaves sang them before, because we too are in bondage and the songs add hope to our determination that we shall overcome. Black and white together, we shall overcome someday. So for King, Singing the words we shall overcome together was important precisely because it expresses the determination that King hoped to cultivate in himself, who, as someone who also battled despair. There are often moments of despair where he has people sing to him, for example, as a way of lifting his spirits, um, and, but also in his fellow, his fellow his demonstrators. And notice that built into this idea of we shall overcome is a philosophical moral commitment, right? Which is, the song says, we shall overcome someday black and white together. Now, King thinks it's not just black folks who have a duty to bring about the American dream. Remember that, that point about desegregation, but also integration. It's a duty that in particular falls upon white Americans, right? They're the ones failing to live up to the promise. So for King, you can see these philosophical commitments sort of already starting to come out in the songs that he's talking about. So We Shall Overcome was originally a work song that enslaved people in the fields would sing. Um, but it was adapted by the Methodist minister, Charles Albert Tindley, who published a version in the early 1900s, which was then adapted again by Zilphia Horton, Pete Seeger, Guy Caravan at the Highlanders Folk School, and taught to unions across the South. Later, as chief strategist for the SELC, Wyatt T. Walker taught the song to students and adults that were involved in the movement. So he explains the song's power. He says, <clears throat> 
One cannot describe the vitality and emotion this one song evokes across the Southland. I've heard it sung in great mass meetings with a thousand voices singing as one. I've heard half a dozen singing it softly behind the bars of the Hines County Prison in Mississippi. I've heard old women singing it on the way to work in Albany, Georgia. I've heard the students singing it as they were being dragged away to jail. It generates power that is indescribable. So for Walker, singing that song generates the very kind of determination that King believed was needed to appropriately face and respond to disappointment. So it becomes a way to channel all the yearning and longing of disappointment into concerted action. So elaborating on the song's motivational power in his memoir, Walking with the Wind, Congressman John Lewis wrote, we shall overcome sustained him throughout the movement, especially when those who had beaten, arrested, or detained stood and sung it together. He wrote, it gave you a, a sense of strength to continue to struggle, to continue to push on. So like the spirituals of his black ancestors, King believed that singing We Shall Overcome would move black folks by providing them with the determination they needed to not only face their disappointment head on, but to carry it forward into political action. Singing We Shall Overcome is a way of expressing disappointment and enacting determination. Now, Marcus, and this remembers the book that I talked about by Sarah Marcus on political disappointment, she is very critical of King's suggestion to sing We Shall Overcome as part of the movement. And her arguments against King are drawn from within the context of the March Against Fear, um, which was organized by James Meredith in 66. Um, Meredith intended to walk from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi as a way of expressing his disappointment in the slow pace of change that followed the passage of civil rights legislation of 64 and 65. So on the second day of the march, as many of you will know, um, James Meredith was shot. And after this point, King and Stokely Carmichael show up and sort of start taking over in some ways. Um, so they both show up and we know this march, many of us, especially outside of the US like myself, because this is where Stokely in, like, introduces the chant Black Power to a broad audience. It was obviously used much before that, but it becomes sort of a more public phenomenon in this moment. Now, at a particularly tense moment, Carmichael's, as King tells it, start chanting black power while King and his supporters are attempting to sing, we shall overcome. And then where do we go from here? As King tells the story, here's what he writes. Once during the afternoon, we stopped to sing, we shall overcome. The voices rang out with all the traditional fervor, the glad thunder and gentle strength that had always characterized the singing of this noble song. But when we came to the stanza, which speaks of black and white together, the voices of a few marchers were muted. I asked them later, why do they refuse to sing that verse? The retort was, this is a new day. We don't sing those words anymore. In fact, those, those, the whole song should be discarded. Not we shall overcome, but we shall overrun. King says, as I listened to all these comments, the words fell on my ears like strange music. So again, contrast to um, the songs of his ancestors with their familiar, and, and, and these words to him sound like strange music from a foreign land. My hearing was not attuned to the sound of such bitterness. Now, Marcus sees the debate between Carmichael and King as largely one about tactics. King's obviously in favor of nonviolent action. Carmichael and the student the, and SNCC, SNCC, under his direction, become disappointed in that old tactic. As he said, this is what Carmichael says, we've been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. Or as Malcolm said, we want freedom now, but we're not gonna get it saying we shall overcome. We've got to fight until we overcome. Carmichael, like Malcolm, no longer wished to submit passively to blows and bites in the service of unrealized dreams of freedom. He wanted black power now. Now, Marcus gives us a beginning account of why King preferred to sing we shall overcome over we shall overrun and even over chanting black power. In her interpretation of King's views, the main goal of nonviolence is to dramatize the problem at hand. In this case, what it aims to do is to put the brutality of white supremacy on stage, in a way, and to display that, and to display black patience in its face to a broad American audience. And then the thought is that that dramatization forces spectators to confront the problem of white supremacy, produces a change, and thereby creates the beloved community, an interracial community of spectators who are transformed and work together unceasingly to make King's dream a reality. Now, Marcus is largely unconvinced by this argument in favor of singing We Shall Overcome, which she sees as a passive attempt to dramatize social evils. And she sees the shifting towards chanting black power as an expression of disenchantment with nonviolence and a desire for something more active in the pursuit of freedom. Now, 
I think when we think about some of the things I've told you about King, this doesn't fully get the story right. I'm not going to defend King. I'm just going to try to say that minimally we have to understand his philosophical views before we can even evaluate King. And I think Marcus doesn't really get them right, so we don't get the full story here. So one thing I think that Marcus misses is that King is really speaking in his advocation of black spirituals and religious music. He's speaking to a black audience, and he's thinking about what will resonate with the folks from his own church. And he thinks that singing is a tradition that has been long present in the church, and it's going to, what's, it's going to be what rouses people. He's not speaking to a white audience. I do think a lot of interpreters of King get him wrong because they always think that he's forefronting a white audience. King's thinking about the white audience and what will appeal to the white audience. That isn't actually true. In all of these sermons about disappointment, he is speaking to black folks, his community, who are experiencing disappointment and despair. And he's thinking about what is going to get us through this moment. And when we think about that, that's part of his story. And it can't be really ignored as we interpret and evaluate King. So he's not just thinking about what's going to transform white people. It's a lovely side effect that it also transforms white people, but he's actually more dominantly concerned with the transformation of black people. So when we think about King now, thinking more about what I've also said about his disappointment, so one thing is we got to think about his audience. I think a lot of interpreters of King don't do that. Secondly, we need to think about philosophically what he said about disappointment. And the debate between him and Carmichael, as he sees it, isn't really just about tactics. It's actually about the best way to express black disappointment and to encourage action to secure what's most wanted. Now, because Marcus doesn't delve deeply into King's views about disappointment, she doesn't realize that King sees we shall overrun and even statements of black power as expressions of bitterness, which in his view is a wrong approach to dealing with disappointment. Because as we know, King prefers an approach of dogged determination over bitterness. Now, I think that in some ways, King also gets Carmichael wrong, and I'd, I'd be happy to say more about that. But at least on the first reading of King, he sort of says, what I heard was a sound of bitterness, right? And he thinks that that's actually really antithetical. Remember, he says bitterness is not the way to go because it's actually bad for black people, right? Because either there will be um, a bitterness towards oneself, which isn't good for the soul, or there'll be a bitterness towards uh, white people expressed through aggression, but then that will ultimately lead down to violent clapback on black people and will hurt black bodies, right? So bitterness for him is not the right response. And you hear this debate between Carmichael and King go on and on and on and on, right? Um, and it's basically, this is the core of the debate, right? And so we see it happening even in these moments of that song. Now, I think what Marcus does get right is that Carmichael and the other folks that are in the black power movement are not moved by singing We Shall Overcome in the way that King was. And Marcus argues ultimately the King did become more aware of the limits of the old spirituals and their capacity to properly express disappointment and encourage determined action. Because she notices that in some later speeches that King makes in Chicago, so now that he's gone north, I think this is important too, right? So now that he shifts from the south to the north, he's sort of questioning whether black spirituals are really the way to go. Different audience, right? And so King at this point starts to seem to accept the importance of the more chaotic and less predictable sounds of feet marching. And he writes, I am still convinced there is nothing more powerful than to dramatize and expose a social evil than the tramp, tramp, tramp of marching feet. So now he's stepping away from we shall overcome and talking about the sound that the feet, that of feet marching makes. Sounds more militant, right? But even here, Marcus is unconvinced. She criticizes King's appeal to Tramp, 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 which was a quote of a well-known political song. In it, prisoner of war sing Tramp, 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 and this is important, though they never hear their comrades arriving to free them. So you've got a bunch in this song, there are people who are in prison and they sing Tramp, 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 and it's an imagined future where someone will come. But as of yet, nobody has come. And so she writes that the prisoners are singing the sound themselves to encourage each other through the sadness. And she objects, writing, as if singing could be a substitute for the real thing or might even call forth its real world counterpart. The song echoes the sound of what would never approach. Instead, the song closes with the image of the prisoners waiting for the door of their iron cells to open and imagining seeing home and their friends once more. Now, Marcus complains that though the song portends of freedom, the song doesn't depict the actual arrival of liberating forces. It's a song about people who have supposedly achieved victory, but who nonetheless remain imprisoned. And she says, look, there might be some comfort in singing a song like that, but she's unconvinced that it relieves or properly expresses people's disappointment, especially at this later point in the movement, where, as Carmichael notes, years of disappointment have been building. But I think Marcus again misses something. There is deeper philosophical significance to King's use of tramp, tramp, tramp. Because what we actually see is even though he is um, 
I think in a way there's a kind of pluralism because on the one hand you've got the tramp, 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 which is the marching, but it's still being expressed in song. So in a way King is still almost like doubling down on the importance of singing and song. And as the song suggests, victory is not guaranteed. It is elusive. And that is part of what it is to acknowledge the disappointment that enjoins unfulfilled dreams. So our desires and hopes for freedom may never be fulfilled, right? This is the tragic element of King's realism. King doesn't know whether he will be free or whether his children will be free from racial segregation. But despite this tragic reality, he has to go on and act as if that dream can and will be fulfilled. So we may, as King suggests, right, he says we can remain in prison, unable to reach life's Spain, but he believes we still have to find a way to transform that prison cell from a dungeon of shame into a haven of redemption. So King must, and he thinks that we must, tramp, tramp, tramp on and work ceaselessly to fulfill his American dream, even when things remain uncertain and unlikely. And so for him, that's where the power of tramp, tramp, tramp lies. It expresses and fosters a feeling of determination, even when it may seem futile, even when you're imprisoned and you have no idea how you're going to get out. And this disappointment is deeply entrenched. This is a way for him to face that disappointment and to continue on in determined action. So I haven't tried to give any kind of defense, I want to make that clear, about King singing We Shall Overcome versus chanting Black Power. I actually think in a lot of ways the debate, there's a lot more to unfold here. But we can only evaluate this debate properly if we actually get a sense of King's views, philosophical views on the nature, value, and function of disappointment. And my hope is that I've at least elucidated the debate between Carmichael and King. They're fundamentally having a debate about what will foster political action and determined action in the face of disappointment and despair. And how do we best express those emotions? And what is, there's also a deeply pragmatic debate that's happening between them too. What is most likely to secure racial justice? And a lot of this is also steeped in their views about the different emotions. So I guess this is uh, where I will end. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. <laughs> So we have time for q and A. I I have the small microphone to walk around if you want to ask some questions. Um, if you can, raise your hand so I can see who the first person is. I'll look around, keep looking around for others who want to ask questions. Um, and I'll look for the first hand now. You mentioned that you thought King got Carmichael wrong, and I would like to hear more about that. <laughs> well, I guess I think that in many ways, he thinks that they are wrong. The Black Power Movement is wrong in part because of its commitment to, not, to, to violence. And I think that actually there's just a debate here, as I guess I was kind of gesturing at, about like, what do we actually do in the face of disappointment and despair, especially when it's been long going? Um, and it isn't just about the tactics of it also. Like, I don't think it's just about that. It is about this. We have these pent up frustrations and despair. And what is the right way of dealing with that? And I think um, a lot of the arguments that King gives against black power also have to do with the understanding of power and what we mean by that. And we actually see King sort of change his minds because at this point he's writing, he's like, not sure in the beginning. He's very critical of the black power movement. And I think actually a lot of King's arguments against black power are largely forgotten because they don't resonate in the same way that they did for him. Um, so he thought that ultimately the black power was a, a kind of method. He thought that ultimately it was a way of leading to black suicide. He says this explicitly. And I just think that that, I mean, I think maybe he would change his mind today, but I think that's actually wrong. Um, and I do think you see King sort of take some steps where he starts talking about the importance of power. He says black power is something we do need to materialize better conditions for black people, we do need political power. But he says that that power always has to be balanced by love because he's worried. So for him, part of the reason he's concerned about black power is because he's concerned about the white power movement and the way that power can be co-opted and used in ways um, that don't respect the humanity of all. And I think he worries that there's a sentiment in the black power movement. He talks about it sometimes that there, that there is a kind of black superiority complex um, within those in the black power movement. But I think he's wrong about that. And I think he comes around in time to the idea of black power and being more open to it. We see that in some of the later writings um, because he comes to see that 
power is a very important thing to have, especially political power, democratic political equality. Um, so he does make some steps, but he's always going to say it's got to be countered by love. Why does he say that? Because in our search for power, he still believes that violence is never justified. Now, I've written in some of my own work just to give it a long, rambly answer to this, but I do think even King's views on violence and what forms of violence are acceptable is more nuanced than people realize. Um, he does say to us that riots actually have a spirit of nonviolence. Why does rioting have a spirit of nonviolence? Because riots are normally aimed at property and the destruction of property. For him, rioting becomes an embodied criticism of white capitalism and racial capitalism. I actually think King is one of the very first people in the US to talk about racial capitalism in this way. Um, and so even there, King is more nuanced. He becomes more open to black power, more open. We see this towards the end, to the use of violence in the sense of rioting, so long as it's never directed against people, though. So when we look at some of the rioting, for example, that took place after George Floyd, um, you know, the damaging of windows of Target, for example, um, I don't think King would necessarily see that as inherently problematic because that was aimed at property, which, you know, racialized people in the US are continuously excluded from. And so this becomes an embodied criticism of racial capitalism. So there are all these moves King starts to come towards, towards uh, um, I think, towards Carmichael in a lot of ways. There's a beautiful book by um, Reverend James Cohn on Martin and Malcolm in America, which actually talks about the two of them moving towards each other, um, which I think is right. Carmichael was from Trinidad. Do you think the fact, and I've done some reading of um, West Indians or Caribbeans who come to this country black and who are stunned by the level and the intensity of white hatred of black people, um, particularly at that time. Do you think that that might have had some impact on the way, on his impatience with the idea of of continuing to march and to use nonviolence? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, I think you're right. I mean, I do think that there is a kind of moral shock that happens for people who migrate to the US who are um, of African origin. I do think that that's right, and that may very well have um, impacted him. I guess the way that I think about it is actually that, you know, he spent, he's from New York ultimately, right? So I do think there's something about a Northern mindset that's like, let's chant because it's more secular as well. It's not coming from a deeply religious tradition. And it's interesting to me that even King starts moving in the direction of chanting when he goes to Chicago. Why, again, he's in a northern audience. But I think when he's in the south, he feels like there's this long-standing tradition of singing that is not only beautiful, but it's like an important tradition linking the current generations to the past. And I think that's really important for King that there's this long legacy of the civil rights movement that's so connected to the past. And for him, the song is like the way of connecting it. And I don't think Carmichael sees it that way. And I think what's interesting, though, is he also represents a bit, of a, a bit of a shift. Like, there is something happening, right, just as you're suggesting, that there is a growing sense of moral horror and shock and urgency. And I think that the chant Black Power um, picks up on that. And I guess one of the other things I wanted to say is that, you know, King maybe doesn't give enough credence to the idea that chanting itself Black power, freedom now, it is a way of generating energy. And there's a long tradition of call and response that comes from West African religious traditions that you have here in the South as well. So like, even the chanting actually is more connected to his ancestors than King allows. I haven't said that in this the talk so far, but that is part of, part of my thoughts, that King isn't really giving full credence to what Carmichael has to say, that there is a tradition of chanting that is connected to the past. But I do think there's something to be said about the North-South difference. And there, I think you're right to point out like Carmichael's history and where he's coming from and how that's potentially influenced his views on what's happening in the US. Can I ask a question? So King rejects four options to the problem of disappointed hopes. The first is a, a kind of denial. The second is a bitterness. The third is detachment. And the fourth is fatalism. He offers a fifth, which is this dogged determination. Right. Is that, there was a later quote that I saw I was struck is where he says something like add hope to determination. So I've always interpreted that fifth option as hope. an expression of hope, right? This is a kind of dogged determination in the face of what looks like um, inevitable disappointment, but still possible um, 
goodness that could come out of this. So I've always interpreted dogged determination as a kind of, or as an expression of hope, but then that last quote says something like add hope to the determination. I'm wondering what is dogged determination if it's not hope? It's something embodied and energetic. So I just think that that's something that's missed in a lot of King scholarship, that King is really interested in how do we energize? Because in the whole tradition of nonviolence, there's a thought about energy and how energy gets transmuted in different ways. And so I think King is picking up on this tradition. How do we put that energy into embodied action? Well, singing is a way to get people out of their seats and moving. And so yes, there's hope because he still has those expectations. Uh, in the paper, I talk a bit about the standard account of cope, which is want plus expect. And so King has the want for the end of racial segregation, he has the expectation, so he still has hope. But you're right, he's got to get to dogged determination, which is this energetic thing that moves bodies. Hmm. I mean, I'd be really curious to hear what people in the audience think. Like, is King totally wrong about black power versus we shall overcome? Is it too, is he like old school? Like, I'm so curious, like, well, I can't read the room. <laughs> Usually I can see people's faces or some nodding, but I don't know what y'all are thinking. So I'm curious, does anybody want to share their views? I would love to know more um, what people think. It would be okay to say King is dead wrong. I think there's a lot that he gets wrong here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna make my way over to the other side of the room, just a second. <laughs> I saw Stephen's hand first and then I'll come to Marianne. So. First, thank you for coming to talk to us. I've written like f four paragraphs of questions, so I'll email you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of them, one of the questions I have, and I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did I hear you correctly in the beginning of your lecture that King's view of the American dream was somewhat, if not, I won't say fully, but just rooted in the promise of a, in the promise within the democratic framework of our government, including, as uh, you mentioned, documents like the Constitution, the Emancipation Proclamation. So, okay, so if so, um, what do you think King would say to the many Americans today who invoke his beliefs and ideals and the civil rights movement as grounds for dismantling or radically altering America's democratic framework? Yeah, I think that's a hard question. And I don't know, I mean, I'd have to hear who you have in mind, like that they kind of appeal to King in that way and what you mean by dismantling the democratic framework. Like, say more about that before I answer. Um, in really, really simple terms, right? Like that, that what, is promised within the, the those foundational documents or the foundation of the framework isn't sufficient to bring about the change necessary to ensure equality in our, in our country. Because it sounds to me like you said, yeah. King looked at that, even appealed to even JFK at some point, though, but said, you know, like the promise that's in the, the idea of what this nation could be based on these ideas, these inherent democratic ideas, right. that could actually achieve what we need. And it seems today to be that there are some cases, you know, where it's like, no, we need, we don't even need this at all. Like, this, this is totally bad. It, it, it only ensures this for one. Right. So, person. for better or worse, I think the language that one might use for King is that he's a reformist. Like, he does believe that the foundation of the U.S., even if it has to be reinterpreted and rethought, those the basic commitment to liberty, fraternity, equality, dignity, those core values are like the guiding democratic light for him. I don't think he ever gives up on that. But, you know, King is a social democrat. He would definitely think there's some major things that need to be revised. He constantly proposed legislative and policy-based changes. He wanted to have a second Marshall Plan that would focus on redistribution of wealth. King was definitely a committed socialist for sure. Um, so I think he was very radical, but he definitely believed in those founding documents as setting uh, a standard in many ways. That, again, might have to be reinterpreted uh, and, and fought for, but he definitely remains a kind of committed American in many ways. Like to me as a Canadian, that's how he reads, as someone who's committed to the foundational documents of the United States. And I think he is like that in the way that Langston Hughes is also like that. In many ways, this is, right, this, this discussion of the dream is, is, is coming from some poems written by Langston Hughes, Dream Deferred, and which gets picked up uh, by Lorraine Hansberry and, and Raisin in the Sun. So like there's a group of people that have these ideas, right, that are committed to the American core values, but they want to, re to interpret them in a way that is truly liberatory and egalitarian. Yeah. For me, I would say black power. Mm -hmm. But others, they would say overcome. Right. Mm 
Okay. Yeah, so it might be some generational divides because maybe people's views are changing about what the right approach is. Yeah, part, part of that, too, has to do with what does black power mean? And, and I know that's a contested, like, when, it, when the term black power was initially proposed, it, in a very contextualized way in Lowndes County, right, it has to do with establishing political power within the local space, right? And then it gets bigger than that, right? And so I think part of that is a contested view on what, is it, what does it actually mean? What does black power actually mean? And, and I think that's a, that's a tricky thing, right? And I think what's interesting is looking at the movement for black lives. There wasn't a return to freedom now or to black power. There was something else, and which is Black Lives Matter, which in some ways is a return to King because it's an emphasis on black dignity, which is a really core concept in King's work. I think it's also very present in Malcolm's work, actually, too. So I do think what's interesting is we get Black Lives Matter, which is a chant, which suggests a generational change. I think you're right about that. And that maybe singing, and also, look, let's be real, like, a religious movement is not going to be the basis of a movement across the country today. I just don't think that that's going to happen. So you'd need something that people from different religious traditions, secular traditions, could grasp onto. And I think Black Power offered that, actually. Um, and that, that makes sense to me, too. Maybe as the movement, as you're suggesting, is moving out of the South and becoming more, more Northern and maybe more, more national, we have to move beyond like emphasis on a religious uh, song. And I think today when we think about BLM, we do see something that's pretty like open. You could come to Black Lives Matter from a religious commitment to the equality of all persons created in the image of God. You could come there from a more political standpoint where you just believe that in the inherent worth. You could be a Kantian, uh, for those of you who do philosophy. Like There are a lot of different ways you could get there. So I do think we see BLM almost learning from this discussion about black power versus we shall overcome and trying to find something that's very pluralist. So this will be, sorry, this is gonna be our last question for now because we've got a little break, but we're gonna have some time for some reflection and additional discussion in the next session. So this won't be done. So I'm gonna give Marianne Martin the last chance to ask a question and then we'll, we'll go from there. In this community, we had Reverend and Mrs. Robert Gratz who are Goodwill Ambassadors for Alabama State University and they organized over a dozen conferences on the beloved community. And Reverend Gratz, who's now the late Reverend Gratz, he used to always talk about how Dr. King always wrote and promoted the beloved community. Have you done any readings on the beloved community? Yeah, so I think people, I mean, he does obviously talk about the beloved community as a kind of table of brotherhood where we can sit with each other, uh, you know, elbow to elbow and share in the table um, and eat together. But I think... Um, yeah, so King definitely believed in the beloved community, but I think in a way what we're talking about is how do we get there? And I think that's really one of the biggest questions, because I think many of us have a concept of equality and maybe justice and what we're looking for, but the hardest question is how do we get there? And I think that's really the question that motivates King. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the beloved community and articulating that ideal. I think there are a few reasons for that. As Coretta Scott says, uh, Coretta Scott King says, every generation has to fight for justice anew. So I think we rethink what real equality and fraternity and justice look like with every generation. And so I think um, King isn't gonna really tell us exactly what the beloved community looks like. He's more concerned with how do we get things to be better now? How do we remove legal barriers, especially um, to equality? So I think the beloved community is a very present idea, and I think a lot of other people have done on those ideas, but King is in some ways so much more focused on the material here and now, and what can we get done now, and how do we do it? I think this is a good place to stop. Please join me in thanking Dr. Amina Krishnamurthy. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.